do. So you see this this um, egg beater thing in its natural configuration, right? So now what I'm going to do is spin it up. And this is what happens as a... The troubles are getting the actual... There we go. So you see what happens as it spins up. It makes a beautiful disc, right? And if I slow it down, and it assumes its natural shape again. This is exactly what happens when a star forms. The natural tendency of the spinning object, as it gets smaller, it will spin faster and faster, just like, you know, pulling the coke ball over the ice skating. You know, the end of every Olympic ice skating routine, the, the ice skater pulls her up and it's faster and faster. It's exactly the same thing. So in this diagram, the disc on the right would actually have a greater diameter than the sphere on the left? No, about the same. Oh, okay. About the same. Actually, a little bit, a, a scooch smaller. So what's happening is this way, there's no problem with conservation of and this way there is. All right? So when, when you have a rotating object that's collapsing, Newtonian physics tells you you get a disk, which is a wonderful thing, because that's, what, that's where we come from. So I'll show you how to disk. Uh, the next question, though, is yeah. how do you get the whole cloud rotating? Oh, if you've got just a right. Well, they're, they're, they're always random motions. And the, 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 the chance you have actually zero net rotation at all is infinitesimally small. So you, a cloud typically has the, 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 the typical random motions in molecular clouds are about five kilometers a second, about a thousand miles an hour. And so those, the small residual motions get amplified as the cloud collapsed. Just as you, you know, as you pull your arms in, you spin faster and faster. If you're spinning at all, just by accident, just a little scooch, as you pull it in and in, you go faster and faster and faster. And that spin up is what creates these disks. And we see disks. We see disks around all the, the most famous example is this um, star called um, Beta Pictoris. And this is a picture of the, the dust around this is an infrared image of Beta Pic. It's a southern hemisphere object. And here's the solar system with Pluto. And you see this amazing disk around. This is a real picture. This is the original picture. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. Just gorgeous, right? Clearly, this is a disk. Here's another picture of Beta Pic in a different wavelength. It's, it's, it, it, this is exactly what you expect. Now, the problem with finding disks is you have to catch them edge on. If they're this way, you don't notice them so much. So you have to catch them edge on. So there's also luck involved in the, in the orientation of the object. Here's some other wonderful Hubble Space Telescope pictures of young stars. This is in the Taurus star formation region, the nearest star formation region to the sun. This is a low mass star forming region, not particularly interesting to me, but all right. Stars are forming. They're little tiny little stars like the sun, insignificant. But what you're looking at, this is the light from the star shining against the dust, reflecting off the dust. And this black spot is the disk obscuring your view. So you see these beautiful disks in all these cases. This this is the most famous one. This is just amazing. Perfect. How it's massive are these disks? Our, our solar system uh, has almost all the mass in the sun. That's right. These are tiny. Yeah, they, they're, there's not much mass in these disks at all. A small fraction of the stellar mass. At most, um, I think the beta pick one is one thousandth of a solar mass. So it's not particularly um, massive. But there's the light, the, the dust is so reflective that you can see them quite easily. Now, accompanying these disks are these phenomena called outflows. Now, this is not quite understood, but it is an observational fact. And when you make a disk, as the star um, um, accretes material onto it, the accretion is just the act of gravitational pull onto the surface of the star, the disk channels it into twin jets. So you have jets perpendicular to the disk shooting off in both directions. And the formation mechanism of this, of this disk, of the, of the outflows, is still not quite understood. But here's a, here's a really nice example. Here's the disk, edge on. This is the light from the star. And then you see these gas jets just shooting off. And this is one like a, if you take a garden hose and one like this, the disk is processing a little bit. It makes this little corkscrew pattern in the sky. This is just beautiful, right? And it's shocking when it hits the material at the end. This is, these are gorgeous objects. 
Is beautiful. it possible these discs could have a magnetic field? Oh yeah, they, they almost certainly do. And most theories about how um, these outflows form invoke magnetic fields. Now, for me, I'm just a poor observer. I don't understand theory. And when people start talking about magnetic fields, I just like, my eyes glaze over. I see you know, Maxwell equations. And that's like that. um, it looks like magnetic fields are integral to formation of these disks. Mm -hmm. What happens is the magnetic field probably gets tangled up in the spinning, and it forms these like helical patterns, and the, the gas gets launched off by the magnetic field. In that left picture, I'm not quite sure what I've seen. The star was the star is there. The star is there. There's, okay. there's a little disc that you can barely see, maybe not oh, all there. Okay. And then what you're seeing is the is the is, is like a garden hose okay. gas is shooting off right. into this corkscrew pattern. How is the rotation? Then you can ascertain some rotation. Yeah, the, the, you know, it's you know being tens of kilometers a second. Okay, these speeds. Yeah. Now, here's my lame example of an outflow, but this is one of the these baby stars that I showed you before. This is my favorite cloud IRDC 43, infrared dark cloud 43. There's the core, whoops, there's the core in the middle. And so what would happen if you have an outflow? Suppose the outflow is not edge on but tilted. Some of the gas would be coming at you, say on the upper side. Some of the gas would be moving away from you at the lower side. And so you would be seeing redshift of gas on one side there, blue shift of gas on the other side there. And we see this toward several of these infrared dark cloud cores. Yeah. Now, would there be a characteristic, if you went from the center of the disk out to the edge, would there be a characteristic fall off of the light that might indicate it's a disk? Yes, there would. And then if you have something like this, right. even. Now the problem is with, with <laughs> yes, I mean, that's true. Disks are actually much easier to see in low mass stars because they last longer. <laughs> the, the, the high mass stars, once they become a, a real star, it's blast them to smithereens. So the disk phase is very short-lived. And it looks like also in, in a low-mass star, you see these beautifully <coughs> narrow jets. These outflows are really tiny and very well linear. Right? You see these lines. In the high-mass stars, they tend to be more fan-shaped. It's not a squirting jet. It's more like a spray for reasons that are not understood. What's the circle? This is, the center of this is the... Yeah, is, Oh, that's the size of our telescope beam. Oh, okay. That's the angle resolution. All right. Yeah. So the, the, this is the, um, the dust, and this is um, emission from the molecule um, carbon monoxide. This is actually 13 carbon monoxide. So the blue shift of stuff is there, the red shift of stuff is there, and they're well separated. All right, the last thing is planet formation. This is not my area of expertise, but um, what happens next is that the heavy elements that are made um, inside of a massive star are dispersed in supernova blasts, and so heavy elements accumulate in space. And once they are in the circumstellar environment, they form complex molecules. And then the dust grains form from these heavy elements. Now, the origin of dust grains is actually not particularly well understood either. The current idea is that they form in the atmospheres of red giant stars where the, the conditions are right, they're not so hot that molecules can't exist. There's enough metals there, and then they, it's a nice factory to make little particulates. So it looks like dust grains, tiny dust grains form actually inside the atmospheres of red supergiants, and then are dispersed into the interstellar medium when the star eventually blows up. Now these dust grains then mix in with material from which a new star forms, and um, so these dust grains are then part of this process. And when dust grains are found in a disk, they're very cold. The disks are initially quite cold. When dust grains are cold, they stick together. Um, just like your tongue would stick to a cold um, surface. They, you know, cold things are stickier. And so the dust grains begin to stick together, and they form these little clumps. So they go from particles a few microns across to something like a centimeter across. So they form these little clumps, pebbles. 